Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And thank you to Lakeview for wonderful hospitality. And uh, as Katie said, I'm filling in for Dan, who is uh, the founder of Florida Recovery Schools, an amazing sober high school. Uh, part of my uh, discussion today on the continuum of care for treating adolescents and substance use disorders. Something of uh, um, a rarity, um, uh, recovery high schools, and Dan has developed an amazing one in Jacksonville. So in Florida, you guys have the only recovery high school in the state of Florida. And um, Dan uh, is a, a great friend and uh, a brilliant clinician, and so I'm just honored to, to come in and, and fill in for him. So. Um, one of the things, uh, let's take a deep breath. <sighs> I do it with the kids every day. I come in and see them every day. Take deep breaths and everybody calms down. Um, so uh, the continuum of care for treating adolescents um, is something that, that I have a great deal of passion about because um, this is all I do. And I believe that kids obviously have the same rights as adults. And we have given adults the, all the opportunities in the world to remain abstinent and get their behaviors together and stay at work. Um, and, and children, we send, tend to just send them to treatment. So I own a residential treatment center, um, and I'm a person saying don't send them directly to treatment from you know, their home, that there should be other interventions that uh, should be utilized before uh, sending kids away from their homes. So, I'm pretty, you know, in, in general, pretty immature, and, uh, and, and, and I, my flight is, 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 I just bop around. So any questions that you have that arise that come up for you guys, just raise your hand and we'll stop and, and do that. I like that kind of format more so than waiting till the end. Because if you're like me, then you forget your question or something. So just raise your hand and we'll get going. All right. So. Fact is the use of alcohol and other drugs is a leading contributor to death among adolescents. Number one, far and away, um, is substance use. And you compound that with greatly increased sexual violence, unprotected sex, and unplanned pregnancy. So sentinel events can occur in adolescents through the use of substance use that is going to provide traumatic response for the rest of their lives. You know, that they are going to be making decisions. And I tell families this. Unfortunately, your child is in an extremely narcissistic phase of development. Um, our population tends to take that to the extreme. Um, they're extremely selfish. They believe that they are invincible. All the stuff that you think in, and you know about teens. Um, you mix that in with substance use disorders. The risk taking goes through the roof and the, the ability to um, have something happen to them or them to uh, um, conduct themselves in a way that it'll affect them forever. You know, that they could catch charges at 17 years old that are felonies and they are then completely eliminated from certain sectors of employment. They can't go practice law. They can't go into finance. They can't be in the FBI. You know, they can't go. It's, it's just a, a really um, unfortunate fact of life that we live in is decisions you make at that age can affect you for the next 60 years. Um, so the initial phase that I believe in firmly is a thorough, thorough assessment process. So 7% um, of teens, 12 to 17, were classified as needing treatment for substance use disorders. Of the roughly 70,000 adolescents in my county, Palm Beach County, nearly 5,000 would then meet the criteria for treatment for substance use disorders. Proper evaluations must include an extensive family risk assessment. So what I mean by an extensive family risk assessment is Obviously, kids are going to be a bit of different historians, right, than their parents. So, you know, I smoke weed, and then they, like, look up because they're trying to think about, like, what's an appropriate amount that this guy wants to hear? Three times per week. And I'm like, three is still a lot, um, and, you know, because they're smoking pot every day. Um, the parents are going to have a ton of information for you that, and for a clinician, that the kids are not going to, uh, to come forth with, you know, that we call it the tip of the iceberg with kids. So kids give you this much, and there's this whole underneath current in life that they're living that no one has any idea. Um, so uh, as well as family reporting of clients' substance use history. Um, and we always will have to include quantitative data, and that is primarily going to be a urinalysis. Now, 
parents will come to you and say, I have drug tested my child and I took him to his doctor and he, he was drug tested. So being a child that was a disaster myself, I passed drug test all the time because people are, in the, in the end, pretty uncomfortable standing close to another teenager, another human in general, when they're using the restroom into a cup. So there are so many opportunities to falsify those tests. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing it at a lab core or a quest where their job is to, they come into the stall with the kid and there's emptying of pockets. Um, I always tell, and, and who, how many clinicians do we have in here? You guys all, everybody, everybody work with kids? If they cannot go to the bathroom, that's a problem. So I tell the parents immediately when they come. If they can't, I can't go. I can't go in front of you. I can't go, you know, and we sit there and we drink water and Coca-Cola for an hour and they're not using the restroom. Or if they do this one, this is my favorite. It's going to be positive anyway. Why waste your money? It's going to be positive for pot. They'll always do that. It's going to be positive. I smoked yesterday. And I'm going to tell parents, unfortunately, there's something else in there that they don't want you to see. So they're going to run the, and, and I, I did kind of the same thing. But they're all pretty similar in that. They, I'll, I'll tell you some things to look out for, and they're pretty, pretty similar in, in their excuses of things of how to get out of stuff. So anytime there's a denial of a urinalysis or an inability to use the restroom, there's a problem. There's something in there that they really don't want you to see, much more than marijuana. So um, common tools for uh, uh, a uh, formal assessment, the, the Addiction Severity Index, the ASI, um, is a very thorough and, and proper uh, um, uh, diagnostic tool, as well as your own company's biopsychosocials. So much like Lakeview probably has Family First Adolescent Services, our company has our own biopsychosocial that we have, you know, um, uh, constructed over the years. Um, and. Uh, Assessment needs to come uh, at, a, at a point in time where um, families are comfortable coming to you guys and, uh, and asking and reaching out for help and, and not delaying that process. An assessment needs to be done immediately. So our viewpoint is we initiate a consultation, an initial consultation somebody calls, and they say, you know what, we're going to do a full assessment. And that's how we'll understand what's going on a little bit better. I mean, it's going to be kind of a three-headed monster here. We're going to get all of your reporting. We're going to get what your son or daughter's um, idea of things are. And then we're going to have a quantitative test, your analysis. We're going to put all of those together, and we're going to come up with an appropriate recommendation based off of those results. So one of the things that um, uh, the first and foremost, uh, I believe, is medically safe. Are, are they medically compromised or medically safe? Uh, by that I mean, what's their uh, potential for mortality? So like, I mean, if they're drinking every day, if they're taking Xanax every day, if they're injecting opiates, if they're meeting drug dealers in nefarious parts of town, um, and I'll also we'll go through some, uh, a really brief, the craft, brief screening assessment that you guys can utilize to understand if further treatment is probably needed. But that is going to require residential treatment. So that there's, there's certain lines that, and on the continuum that we want to draw. Um, you know, it was, and we'll go through um, uh, the ASAM criteria, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and they developed this continuum of care, you know, back in like the late 70s, I think. And uh, it was set up so that people like me, a parent couldn't come to me and say, I found a joint and like, you know, a, a Zephyr Hills bottle with vodka in it, and I would say they need nine months of residential treatment. And so that was happening with kids. They were being put in hospitals and things for, for and adults too, for long periods of time when the, it didn't really match up. So um, one of the example screening tools is the craft, uh, and this was specifically designed for adolescents. Um, it's a screening tool. Uh, it's very quick and easy to administer. Um, as well as pretty sensitive to this specific population. It can also be transferred over with these questions to ask parents as well, um, because again, kids are going to be fairly poor historians um, of their own um, activity, as you can imagine. So, um, and your analysis done properly and supervised and with a quantitative result in a lab is truly going to be the objective assessment. You know, that the lab testing is an important tool in the assessment and diagnosis of substance use disorder in kids. 
it has to include synthetic substances. So, I mean, it's a whole different presentation that I have on synthetic drugs that kids have these days. Um, and uh, they're constantly evolving and changing, more so than we even know. They're like apps. You know, it's like one, you know, minute this drug or substance is hot, it's the spice, and then the next minute, you know, it's something else. It's, uh, it's bath salts or it's um, the, um, what, what's going on in our county now is um, compounding um, powders into fake kind of Xanax. So the, the ingredients are, are, are a little bit unknown, but the hospitals are seeing kids that think they have taken Xanax and they've been kind of pill pressed by local drug dealers and it's not Xanax. So, the Caesar is a, is a great website. If you want to check out, um, it, it has the, it, it, they were the, the folks that developed the craft. It's the Center for Adolescent Substance Abuse Research. Um, it is something that if you want information or really want to start studying um, some things on your own about kids and substance use disorders, this is a wonderful, wonderful place to go. Um, and uh, the, the true uh, comprehensive longitudinal studies are done by the University of Michigan. It is called Monitoring the Future. That is another one um, if you want to reference any qualified studies, any longitudinal studies, any double blind, anything with kids and substance use, this is the gold standard, is monitoring the futures. So when you, know, you have a kid that comes in and says, everyone's smoking pot, you can go to the website and they will have the data nationwide of how many kids are actually smoking pot. And so you could say, well, these guys, you know, they're objective. They're not trying to you know, legalize weed or delegalize it. They're just collecting data, and this is what they found. Um, still, to date, number one is alcohol for kids, and number two is marijuana. And alcohol and marijuana are going to reign supreme forever with kids, because they are the most, at this point for them, 15 years old, the most easily accessible. And they're going to find the alcohol, for the most part, in your home at first, or in your, you know, their friend's parents' home. So that's the first place that usually um, use is, is going to occur. Um, so there's also a big difference, right, in like uh, if you work with kids, it's like, you know, you, and even the parents, everyone, all these kids are smoking weed all the time. And all these kids are drinking. It's a phase of development. Absolutely. There is a, a very good uh, a case to be made that it is a, a phase of development, trying things, testing boundaries, all of that stuff with kids start to get into, you know, how, did you smoke weed every day? Because they'll say, I smoked, you know, I smoked when, when I was a kid. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what do you think your THC content was in that? I don't know. Probably 0.5 to 1%. What do you think that your child's THC content is? Minimum 20%. And then when you get into the oils, it's like 70 and 80%. So if you think about it, um, with the legalization of marijuana, and I'm not an advocate or anything to say, you know, that we, we, we can't do this. Don't, it's, the train is moving down the tracks. It, it will happen. But think about who is now involved in marijuana. Like Goldman Sachs is now involved in marijuana. Like big, big business. So these guys are, have the most brilliant scientists that you can find in labs creating the strongest strains of marijuana. That's the goal. Is, and, and you know, one of the things with alcohol, it's the same as alcohol, it's the same. Alcohol is very, very highly regulated. You cannot go above a per certain percentage point and, uh, without it being specifically labeled and understood. People understand alcohol volume, percentage volume. So marijuana business, they say it's regulated. It's about 15%, if you do the research, about 15% of the weed that they're generating in Colorado and California and all these states is truly regulated. You have no idea the strength of, of that substance. So, um, but it is coming, you know, for anyone that thinks it's not, it's, it's just a matter of time. And, you know, obviously the state of Florida has been delaying some things for a while, but they're just passing through with the medical and that's the first step and um, then it will be legalized. So, has anybody been to Colorado or California recently? Last week. <laughs> is, it, is it not the most shocking thing you've ever seen? Yeah. Um, yeah. Gummies. It just got, I, I was like, 
Holy Spirit. I've okay. never seen anything <laughs> like it. And this was a small dispensary. Yeah. Called. Yeah. And it wasn't a medical dispensary. It was right by a donut shop. <laughs> no. Very famous booby donut shop. So, I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And they're smoking like it would be cigarettes. So yeah. if you go into Colorado and California, you're like, what? I mean, just smoking weed right there. And, and it's like. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Yes, you're going to see that. There's also. Hospitalizations for kids in Colorado are going through the roof. Yeah, yeah. And this is part of the. Th <laughs> it's um, and so you're. They will. People will come up with with amazing arguments against, and they will 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 often reference. How many times have you heard them reference nicotine? Like, well, it's better than smoking cigarettes. Meh. Yeah. Cigarettes are terrible. Uh, they're going to kill you, but that's probably going to be at about 65, maybe, something like that, unless, you know, you're extremely lucky. And weed is going to make you, if you smoke that every day, you are going to live up to 10% of your potential. You're going to have um, uh, the ability, your boundaries now are, are still further removed. So people ask if it's a gateway. I think that alcohol is a gateway as well. It's just what, you know, you have now experienced what it's like to be not you. And that in general is what we're seeing with kids. One of, you know, every parent that I talk to, I can talk to you and tell you about your kid within 30 minutes of talking to you. They suffer from extreme low self-esteem. Um, they are highly sensitive and they take in, they, you know, there's a lot of bravado and, and all of that stuff. They take things much more to heart than other kids do. These are kids you have to look out for, for substance use disorders, because if you have a, a tick of anxiety or attention deficit disorder, you're highly sensitive to criticism. You're highly sensitive to events. You know, families aren't perfect and uh, family systems are going to be dysfunctional at the, the best case. And then the parents walk away from you when you start talking to them because they're modeling what they're doing. Yeah. And so they walk away and they say, not that good, because you know, they're supposed to be Yes, and they'll, you know, uh, but imagine being that kid, you know, and so you have all of these things compounding in your system and in your brain, and then you smoke weed, and it just goes away. All of it goes away. And you're like, why wouldn't I do this all the time? Um, I don't have to feel anything like this. Socially, I fit right into a crowd. I don't have to be a jock. I don't have to be a brainiac. I don't have to be any of this. Socially, I fit right in. I'm fulfilling you know, and finding a niche for myself. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a dangerous combination in the sense of even if you just, you know, I talked to a parent the other day and the, her son was 23 years old. All he's done is smoke weed every day. He smoked weed every day, he, got, he had to be removed from Penn State. He's at home smoking pot every day. And she's like, I guess, you know, other parents have it a lot worse. And I was like, that's true. <laughs> Very true, but when you have your child there, what is your goal for your kid when they're little kids? Be a superstar. Be everything you can be. Live up to your potential. Give me, you know, I will put forth every 
asset that you can have to be the best you can possibly be, that guy's living up to 2% of his potential. And fast forward, you know, the days go slow, but the years go fast. And I tell these guys, you wake up and you're 30 years old and you don't have a college education, you have, don't have any real work history, you are so far behind the curve and the eight ball of what the society is today um, that it's, it's tough to come back from that stuff. So there are consequences for, for continued daily smoking of, of marijuana and obviously of, of, of drinking. So, um, you know, when we talk about, and I like to, you know, even though we're discussing the continuum of care, I like to throw in some education about what's actually going on substance-wise. Um, and marijuana is a big deal. Um, this is going to be, uh, you know, a, a thing across the United States of America. And you are going to start to see much more leniency, much more lackadaisical. Gone are the Reagan Dare commercials. Gone is all of that stuff, of the fear. There's no fear. These kids have no fear. Um, so, you know, the Reagan era in the 80s, you know, that they had, I mean, when I grew up, even though, you know, my, I was a disaster of a kid, pills or stuff like that, that was for like junkies, right? You like saw it and it was like, those are junkies. These kids have none of that. There's no fear of that. There's no boundary. There's nothing. So they are quickly able to move down the line of substances because they want to try new things. They want to feel different. And uh, in, the, in the end, you know, they do want to fit in. I mean, it, it's, it's something. Yes. That, that's true. Let's go back. Yeah, let's go back to the original thing. It is not the same at all. Like your dad's weed, and the psychoactive properties were minuscule. He could smoke four or five joints and be totally cool, go to work. You smoke what they have today, smoke that much of it, you'll be on a different planet. It is completely different psychoactive properties. Well, as far as the practice of using drugs. Yes. Absolutely. Sure. And why did he hide it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, I would, under, I would think that he didn't want his kid knowing that he smoked weed. So. Well, I, I completely agree. And I, I don't think that I, I wanted to come off and say that this was brand new. This is absolutely, you know, alcoholism, we go back to prohibition. This is all substance related. It's just substances. So we go back to the prohibition days and, and alcohol, opium has been around forever. Drug addiction has been around forever. Yeah. That's true. They taste better too. So we're getting a little off track, but we'll circle back. We'll circle back to, to what we what we got going on. Before you go off that slide, my son is just wonderful and has got excellent data for years, but it's not their data. Yes. So for those of you in the room that may not know, um, the Centers for Disease Control does the research behavior survey nationally. And you can get that data off their website. But you can also get county level data from 23 
you can drill it down to the area that's hot. Um, and on top of that, the state of Florida does the Florida Youth um, Substance Abuse Survey, and it also gives you the most protective factors in all of the almost What's your name? Kathy Bowler. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, if you can. Um, How long has it been going on? Right on. Excellent. Thank you. So we'll shoot back to the craft assessment. Um, it's a very brief screening interview. Um, you just want to begin with kids to ask a few questions that you're going to ask. I ask all my patients, do your best to be as honest as you can. I know you've just met me. You know, we've hung out for like seven minutes and you're forced to be here. But do your best. And uh, so let's start with, during the past 12 months, did you? And these are going to be yes or no. Drink any alcohol, more than a few sips. Do not count sips of alcohol taken during family or religious events. Smoke any marijuana or hashish, throw in the oils. Use anything else to get high. And that includes any illegal drugs, over-the-counter, prescription drugs, and things that you would sniff or huff. Now, have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Kids are, if they're not used to getting asked these questions, they'll look up. People in general will just look up, and kids will do it very clearly to you. Watch them. They think. They have to think really quick. No. And you're like, why'd you look up? Um, so, do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax or feel better about yourself or fit in? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you were by yourself or alone? Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? And do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? Have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? So trouble for kids is going to be different, you know? Trouble for kids is, you know, for, for my population, trouble for kids is trouble at home and trouble at school. You know, that legal trouble is, is usually something that um, is mitigated, you know, in, in our county. Palm Beach County is, has a very boater lifestyle, has a very friendly to alcohol and marijuana lifestyle. Police officers take the kids home, you know, that, that type of environment. So legal consequences usually don't arise for them um, unless they're, you know, arrested at school or, or something like that. But the only problem I have is that my parents don't let me smoke or don't let me drink. I mean, that's a real problem for you, though, because you're 15 and, like, you know, you're going to live with them for three years and they're conducting everything about your life. That's a serious problem for you. What do you mean? And, you, you know, being able to to kind of talk to them about an understanding, because they won't get it at first. You tell them that's a problem for you. No, it's not. Yeah, it really is a, a big problem for you. You're going to be grounded. Your phone's gone. Another thing with technology, the phone now means more 
to kids than their car. So their driver's license and things. I don't know if you've seen it where kids, if you work with kids closely, they don't have driver's licenses at 17. They don't care. They, they Uber, you know, they, they, they find ways, friends have cars. The most essential thing to them is their phones. The biggest fight that we have, kids coming into the treatment centers. Can I smoke? No. I need my phone. I'll go if I can have my phone. You know, that's, that's what, I mean, that's all that they want. They want to keep up with their friends. They want connection. They want to, um, to, to keep that going. And uh, um, the screening and brief intervention referral to treatment. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has declared that substance use with screening should occur for all clinical visits with minors age 13 to 17. So what does that mean? That means if you're a pediatrician and you have clients age 13 to 17, you should be using this screening. No, of course not. If you talk to doctors that uh, are in the medical field that they've done one week of substance use in their four years of medical school. So at best, two weeks, sometimes none, zero days spent on substance use. Um, but the American Academy of Pediatrics is stating that you should. Um, so once a concern has been identified through screening, a brief intervention using motivational interviewing or brief cessation counseling is implemented. So that is, uh, uh, it, it ha always has to include parents and guardians as well. Um, so a referral to treatment you know, and, and, and I just kind of want to ask you, what are your guys' resources in Jacksonville for referral to treatment? Katie Armstrong. So what if Katie Armstrong moved to Paris? I follow her. What are your resources? Yes. Okay. 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 Who? Wakova. Okay. Are any of these? So you've got one intensive outpatient, and then a hospital-based program for kids, and then uh, any of those that we mentioned, juvenile justice receiving. OK, you've got juvenile justice. Does, do you guys have a, a program that directly that juvenile justice refers to? Yes. Gateway. OK, so you've got juvenile justice. And besides the wonderful Lakeview Center, how many adult programs do you have? Intensive outpatients? Okay. Two or three private ones. So it's nice to know your resources. So if you're talking about a continuum of care, you're going to want to know your resources, you know what I mean? And, and who is going to be there for intensive outpatient, who can have Yep, well, but, and, and of course, Katie is a wonderful resource. Well, when we, I'm on the board of the Recovery High School. Yes. And we were meeting to um, plan the opening of the Recovery Health Care Program at this resources that I have about this year, because we want to make sure that we're hitting every, if we're talking about every neighborhood, every every uh, type of client that there is. So some clients don't fit into programs. Those families and kids don't fit into certain programs. Oh, that's, that all has to do with zoning and your company and things like that. Like if I, yeah, if I opened a Lakeview, I could have 180 kids in here or something, you know? So, um, it, but for the most part, adolescent treatment is very, very difficult. 
It's extremely hard to treat kids and their families. It does not produce the revenue that adult centers do. And they, the funding and things is going, you know, a lot towards opiate crisis for the counties. And, uh, you know, Palm Beach County just got an endowment. Their major grants, $17 million towards opiates. Our state-funded uh, program, Data, um, gets $260,000 per year from the county. That's how much money they get to treat. They have, like, 20 beds. They gave, like, $8 million to the park system and they gave $220,000 to data. So, yes? Right on. And that's the medication, medicated assisted treatment for, for kids is a hot topic, you know? Why do you think that is? Why? Not testing that doesn't make any money. <laughs> well, that's the prevention. They're more reactive. So the opioid crisis is a reaction to an epidemic of, you know, these things that are happening because then funding is targeted or um, the city want to answer that. So instead of focusing on preventing something going on, they, they just react to it. And we can both fund. So, uh, and I opened Family First for, uh, we have a 10 bed adolescent male facility. And we have one other program in Palm Beach County. That's it, it's just me and one other program. So how are yours funded? Privately. Mm -hmm. They're a different client, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, very true. And in reality, though, in the end, and going back to your point that you know, a large population uses substances, there's about 10% that are going to uh, have disordered use. So it's a 10%, roughly 8 to 10%, um, if you want to boil it down to your county, if you want to boil it down to your neighborhood. If you take, pick out 10 kids, one of those kids is going to have a substance use disorder. And it's just the way that the percentages have gone since the, the material and data started coming out in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it's just stayed constant, that that's, that's our, our thing. So there's going to be plenty of people that go to college, that go are, you know, partying hard in high school and things, and they'll grow out of that. And at 23 or 4, they'll grow out of that. That's why we're talking about screenings that um, briefly done in the beginning and assessments that are done if you're you know efficient at your your job and know what you're doing you can pick it out you can say this is not this isn't gonna go well because it's different you can just see it in the way that some kids are, are smoking and other kids it's just different if they're selling if they're smoking every day if they're smoking before school if they're drinking you know after school every day four days a week five days a week so much different than smoking weed, you know, for a kid on like a Friday night and the bowl comes around and having like four or five beers. It's a big, big difference. And, uh, and that's just, you know, part of, uh, of the assessment process, I think. So referral to treatment and what are your resources and what are our resources? Um, 
Since we have already engaged in the brief intervention phase, the next step, depending on acuity, is a referral for outpatient services. That's the first move, unless we're talking about medically compromised kids, which means a benzodiazepine, which can kill you um, with a detox, alcohol, daily alcohol use, a detoxification can kill you from that, and, uh, and then anything that uh, is putting them in significantly har significant harm's way. So, you know, and that is, again, probably sometimes left up to, it's a, a pretty uh, subjective viewpoint of what, uh, you know, beyond the, the, the detox portion of it, it's subjective to the clinician. Like, for me, if you are going into certain neighborhoods, if you are driving high all the time, if you are putting yourself in that much of, of harm's way, then you have to go to residential treatment immediately. That that is, you know, take you out of the environment that you could expire the next day. Um, but for the most part, our assessments lead to outpatient treatment, which by that I don't even mean intensive outpatient treatment. It leads to what we classify, and the, the first thing that I started was an intensive outpatient, outpatient, just for kids and their families. We call it monitoring. So we are going to plop you down for six weeks. You're gonna come in, you're gonna see a therapist, your family's gonna come to family group, you're gonna take a drug test. This totals three hours a week for you and your family. If you can do six weeks as a kid, you're probably okay. You know, that you're probably using in a, you know, a, a misuse use kind of way, not into the abuse dependence sort of scenario. Not many of the kids that we've entered into that monitoring program have been able to make it six weeks. That they test positive or something will happen three days later. I mean, we had uh, a, a young man who was on probation for trespassing, came to the center, we did the assessment, we said, dude, you meet all qualifications for residential treatment, we are going to give you a shot. Let's do intensive outpatient, you can live at home, you're gonna keep your summer job, cool. That was on a Thursday. Monday, he tests positive for cocaine. And we're sitting down and we're like, what went through your head? And this is literally what went through his head. It'll be out of my system by Monday. Three days, it'll be out of my system. And I was like, it wasn't. What if that was your probation officer testing you and not us? That's not, that's not gonna be okay. Uh, you know, the, once you get roped into a system and into the system, I tell kids, your biggest goal is what? What's a kid's biggest goal? Leave me alone. They want adults to leave them alone. Your behavior right now has like, look around you, like seven adults all over you. Now you've put your hands, your life in my hands, which is not cool, because I'm dictating your life now. Can you follow me? You know, so I, I, I ask the kid, keep up, follow me here. I am dictating your life, look at me, I'm ridiculous, you know, I'm wearing flip-flops, you know, the, nobody, nobody respects me here at all, you know, you, you have to be very joke, I'm, I'm just an immature person with a joke of them, but in reality, you're, you have a probation officer, you have parents, you have me, now you're going to have a residential treatment staff, you're going to have teachers, so you've got like six entities of adults that are, have all eyes on you, and all you ever wanted was everyone to leave you alone, so why did you do all this? I don't know. And then they'll say, I, the most honest answer, I don't know. I don't know why. My brain told me something that wasn't true. And uh, so, but you know, if they're, they are able to, to maintain that sobriety, I tell the parents, you keep a keen eye out on everything and we'll be here for you. But I, you know, I think he's okay. I think that this is okay. I think that this is, you know, and I, I will not, you know, project this to him or tell this to him, but I think that this is a phase of his development, and I think that you just gotta keep an eye out for it and look out for X, Y, and Z and um, in, in regards to operating motor vehicles, safety, all of those things, keep an eye out, but you know, I think he's all right. So during this phase of treatment, the practitioner should immediately engage in a more in-depth, clinically driven assessment tool. So once you're an outpatient and you've done your initial biopsychosocial, you can launch into further assessment, I think, in the first session, which you're getting even more data and more information from your, your client, from your kid. So uh, treating kids is tough. They will stare at you. If, you've, you, know, if you wanna sit and like, you know, I've treated adults too. Silence is a good piece of 
clinical intervention. Sit and stare. Adults kind of make it a little uncomfortable, and then they'll say something. They'll break the silence. So as a new clinician, you're always the one that breaks the silence, right? When you're new, you're like, um, you know. But as you get a little bit more veteran, um, you'll just sit there. Kids will stare at you for 45 minutes. That kid won't talk to me for 45 minutes. You don't want to talk? We won't talk. We'll do it. They're very uh, stubborn, so it's kind of fun. But so that you're wanting to, um, oh, thank you, Katie. I appreciate that. So you're going to want to engage them in, in a much more experiential way, in a much more loose fashion. Um, if you sit with a kid for 45 or 50 minutes, if you can glean 15 minutes of good intervention and good information out of that, that's amazing. That's a win, you know, that, that uh, kids can, can hold you at bay for as long as, as you let them, really. Um, so, of course, accompanied by a parent or guardian, you always want to make sure as a clinician that you are aware of your clientele. Um, you're aware, both male and female, it's just, uh, it's just you know, a little bit more of a, an adolescent female scenario where if you are a male counselor, you want to make sure that everybody in the office is aware and you want to be aware of this young lady's, you know, history, you know, and, and things like that of has she, you know, reported her father or stepfather for abuse? Has she called DCF? You know, we get a hold of kids and like the kid, the kid calls DCF as like an intervention for himself to like get out because, you know, he, he's got grounded or, you know, they were angry with them and they literally will call DCF to the house, um, which is aggressive. So as a clinician, you always want to protect yourself in those scenarios. But um, for the most part, I've never, I've been treating them for 10 years and I've never, never had a concern. Um, so since the idea of anyone, much less an adolescent, being completely forthcoming with information to a person they just met is completely bananas, the parental info is invaluable. So I did an assessment on a kid who said, I just smoke pot. I've smoked probably five times in my life. I tested positive because, you know, three weeks ago was one of the times. And then I talked to the parents at length. Nothing really came up of note. And then we met again. And she looked at him, her husband and said, that, that bottle of 100 Xanax went missing. And I was like, huh. So she was prescribed Xanax, and a bottle of 100 went missing from their house like three months ago. And then she said, and also, remember I screamed at you because I thought you took the $300 out of my wallet. And I was like, OK, so now we're getting a little bit more, <laughs> going down the path a little bit more. Um, and uh, you know, who do you think did that? Was that Paolo, your son, or you know, the tooth fairy? But uh, um, the, the kids are not going to give it up. I mean, that there you are, a, you know, first of all, you're an adult, so you're going to be the enemy in the beginning. And if you, I, you know, I always say when they come to the assessment, do you know where you are? Yes, I'm in a treatment center. You're in an outpatient treatment center right now. I have a residential treatment center that you could go to, but we're in an outpatient treatment center. But we are then directly interfering with their number one coping skill, their, their everything. Getting high and drinking for some of these people and some of these kids is everything. You know, it fits and fills all of their needs. And so we are right in line with that path. So they're going to view you as the enemy and, uh, and probably not be very forthcoming on things. Um, so armed with information from parents, results of lab tests, your analysis, and the youngster's own assessment, the clinician can make an appropriate recommendation regarding level of care. So this is what we're, we're discussing these steps through assessment and recommendations and things, and this is like best case scenario. So a lot of times you're going to run into, and I'm sure that you guys feel, the, feel my pain, you're going to run into extreme resistance from family systems. And from, uh, um, yeah, that is one reason why we never, with kids, I never use the words alcoholic, I never use the words addict. Uh, we don't talk about addiction. Um, we talk about disordered use and how it's playing into the family system. Now, some families are really bought into their child's mental health disorder. They want it to be depression, anxiety, ADHD, something along those lines. Other parents want it to be a substance use disorder. They do not want to think that their child may you know, be, have the beginning stages of bipolar disorder or, or something like that. So always in the family systems, 
So this is best case scenario. I mean, that, that families will lob uh, curveballs at you all the time. So uh, being able to roll with, with the punches with them. So a lot of times, you know, when we do give our recommendation, um, and they're, you know, very standoffish about maybe even an intensive outpatient level of care. Um, the one thing with kids that I believe to be much different than treating adults is adults you can be, I believe, a little bit more black and white. So if you do not want to exist within the boundaries of this treatment program, then that's fine. But you're running into kids who are then really, the parents are responsible to keep the train on the tracks. And if you scare off a parent, there's no chance to help the kid. And so, okay, totally fine. Let's start where you're comfortable then. And what would it look like for you to have to step up that level of care? What would have to happen? Well, I think, you know, if he tested positive again, or if, you know, he, um, you know, steals the car or something like that. So um, once we've got families involved in our system, uh, the family education portion of this, and one of the reasons why I started Family First, um, there were no services for parents. So I was a private practitioner, I had a private practice, I saw mostly teenagers because I was a younger male and there weren't many of us as therapists in, in the area and so I got a lot of referrals of teenagers. There was no family group. And so one of the first things we did was start a family free education group for the community. You don't even have to have a kid. You could have a brother or a sister, a cousin, anybody that you want, and you can come and talk to us about or ask questions and have our master's level therapist run that group so it's not a peer led group. Um, there's direction, there's process, um, but it is primarily used to, to educate the community about what's going on. So one of the things then, if we've got you in our, our clutches, um, we want to tell the parents and the children, this is not just about Johnny. This is about the entire family system. So we are an abstinence-based program, but we are also primarily a family systems-based program. By that I mean the organism of the family is dysfunctional as much as the child is dysfunctional. If you are working with kids in substance use disorders, parents have culpability in this. There is, you know, if you're a 17 year old boy with a lot of rage and a lot of dysfunction and there's not um, an identifiable intermittent explosive disorder or something, let's start looking at home because that's their primary modeling, that's their primary support network, and you're going to find a family system probably that lends itself to this behavior and has created this monster, so to speak, um, through no fault of their own. So this isn't a blaming process. This isn't, a, this isn't anything. This is you guys did the best probably that you could. And I congratulate you and commend you for even sitting in front of me. As we were discussing earlier, a lot of parents just want to stick their head in the sand and not really deal with it and just hope that it goes away. You're here. And so let's honor that. But getting after him as soon as he comes in the door from school about his room being dirty, is that a sentinel event for you? Is, is, is him you know, getting frustrated and kicking the refrigerator? Is that something to lose control over? Is that something to, we're trying to start to coach them into what are events that require your action? And what events are just par for the course? Like if you have, are training a puppy, I mean that dog is going to like pee on your rug. These teenagers are going to, if they're boys, it's primarily a male thing, they might pee on your rug. <laughs> they, might, they might kick some stuff, they might slam some stuff, they might, you know, disappear into their room for two straight days. Um, you know, I am a big fan of eating dinner together. Um, and if they want to then immediately bolt into their room, that's fine. I mean, obviously I want parents to be very, very cognizant and aware of technology today. Very aware of their cell phones, have every single login, and even when you think you've got everything, they've got like burner phones and stuff. They've got burner accounts. They set up fake Facebook accounts, fake Instagram accounts, and they say, here's my account, and the parents say, okay, great, and they'll post on that fake account. But in reality, they've got, you know, Starfish 84 
that they uh, are, are running behind your back. So being able to and stay as, as much on top of things as you can. But um, I'll, I'll ask parents to give me an email. List me the events that you believe to be objectionable. And there'll be three pages from a mom. And I'll highlight four things. These four things, that's what you need to, to get pumped up about. This other stuff is nothing. Him shutting his phone off on a Friday and coming home two hours past curfew, big deal. Him not wanting to talk to you about his day, not a big deal. And people forget, parents forget what it is really like to be a teenager and forget they want to be involved. You know, Just three years ago, their kid was building forts and loved them to death, told them everything that was going on. Now they're 15, 16 years old and want nothing to do with them. It's just an appropriate psychoanalytic phase of development. It's, this is appropriate to push away from the family system as the primary um, and, and look to their own social system. So that's what happens. Their social system becomes everything. They're in an extremely narcissistic phase of their development. It is all about them. They're never going to say thank you unless it's like to meet, to, to meet their own ends. And this isn't just substance use. This is kids. One in a hundred will be on like CBS and like have started a charity and like be selling ice cream and like they got a full scholarship to Harvard because you know, and they're like, well, I want that kid. Not that's not kids. That is an outlier of kids. Regular kids, they give you a lot of trouble and a lot of guff, and they don't want to be around you. They don't want you involved in their world. They want to be secretive. They think they know best. All of these things. So keeping all of that in mind with family systems, especially when we start to look at at substance uses. So now you've got a kid who sneaks out at 2.30 a.m., steals your car, wrecks that car, is brought home by the police, completely inebriated, is failing school. These are things to get up in arms about. These are things to uh, intervene on. The dirty room, the back talk, you know, some of the things that we can work on that stuff later. The respect, and what is your idea of respect in your family system, in your family house? I want to honor that. But let's take a look at the stuff that is happening that is like can detonate everyone's world right now. Because we'll talk about that stuff and they'll be like, and you know, I mean, I, mean, you know, I tell kids and I will sit seven, seven out of 10 times, we'll be sitting at a conference table and I was like, I guarantee if you got bees, cleaned your room and didn't tell your dad to F himself, he would let you smoke pot. And dad would be like, yes, I would. I would, I would let you do that. <laughs> and and I'll, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, they're not trying to be sticks in the mud. We're not trying to be ridiculous. These kids can't control their impulses and their behaviors. They do not know what's best for them. I.e., you can do three simple things. I mean, I bet you can get bees by studying 25 minutes a day. Refrain from cursing and, and screaming at your parents and clean your room. And I bet they'll let you smoke weed on the weekend and like come home and be like, all right, cool. And like, you know, go upstairs and sleep it off. Um, just don't drive, you know. And the parents are always very into that. But I tell them later, aside from that, he can't do that, or he would have already. And uh, did you catch it? No. Is that a fly? Yeah. <laughs> Miyagi. I support mosquito death, so um, they're the worst. So um, family systems are, are very difficult. Um, they're very difficult to navigate and work, and you know, uh, oftentimes you're going to find mom and dad on completely opposite ends of this. So they'll both be sitting there, and dad will be staring at you. Mom is reciting you know, 30 things, you know, and I think that he might have this, and he might have that, and dad's just kind of like looking. And I'm like, so what do you think? And he's like, I think this is... BS, honestly. I think he's fine. And, or you'll have it the opposite end, where dad is, it, it's just much more a common theme for mom to be much more involved. I think that through my dealings with kids and family systems, moms tend to have a much better finger and thumb on what is going on with their kids. That if it's, this is a problem, this isn't normal. Dads, for the most part that I've seen, want their kids to be okay. And, uh, and, and think that it's probably more of a phase of development um, and, uh, and are, are not you know, readily identifying 
some of the, uh, the stuff that mom can. But you got to be aware of that. And I'm aware every time I get into a conference room with mom and dad. Dad is very wary of me. They think I'm all about money. And that's where they're coming from. And I have to be able to be open and honest enough and be able to disarm them and roll with them. Because you know we need you guys on the same page here. But very often, they are going to be on opposite ends of that, of that spectrum of what should be done here in this situation. So. Um, one of the things uh, that ASAM, the American uh, Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, developed, so once that we have identified as having uh, a youngster with a potential substance use disorder, ASAM has long put forth an appropriate continuum. And this stands true uh, through managed care. And if insurance bases things off of it, then that means it's pretty much the gold standard as uh, you know, the insurance companies unfortunately dictate care at this stage of, uh, of the game. Because even though as I am a, a private facility, most of my families, uh, if not all of them, access their insurance benefits heavily. And why? Yes, yeah. So we have a billing company and even, you know, people that are of, of even more means than our average client is usually a strong middle class client. Wants, they work hard, both parents work hard and, and they have, uh, you know, uh, substance use benefits for their, for their child, but even the families that are a, a little bit above class, they want to use their insurance. And so you'd better be able to identify these continuums, and, and insurance wants to see, unfortunately, failure at each level before you get to a residential treatment. So if a child comes to me with a family and they say, he's smoking weed every day, all Fs, we want him in residential treatment. Cool. We can totally talk about that. Insurance is not going to pay a dime of that. They will not pay one cent for you to do that. So that there is no medical necessity in their eyes, and they have not failed at the recent and these earlier levels of care. So the first one is early intervention. That is the brief screenings, pediatricians utilizing those, guidance counselors utilizing those. This is a, a, a brief and early intervention. Um, that is, uh, uh, through the assessment process that we've done, recommended to an outpatient level. So that's going to be a minimum of one hour a week. It could be a group. It could be a family group. It could be an individual session. Intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization. Intensive outpatient. This is through the state of Florida, and for most of the nation, is a minimum of nine hours of direct clinical contact per week, usually settled in with three three-hour groups. Um, if you try and do a three-hour group with kids three times a week, your therapists will completely burn out. You'll want to kill yourself. They'll want to kill themselves. It's going to be terrible. So we split it up into two-hour, four groups, along with individual therapy and family sessions. Um, I'll, it's a whole other presentation that I have on actually how to do groups with kids. If you try and sit down in a circle and just talk to them and process things, it's not going to go very well. You know, um, it's, uh, it's a much more experiential, much more off-the-cuff uh, dealings. Um, you have to be able to improvise and, and do a lot of things with like art, do a lot of things with dressing up, do a lot of psychodrama stuff. Treating kids is, you know, they act hard and stuff, but if you tell them to write you know, their own comic book story as that they're the superhero and have them dress up, we have what's called Superhero Week. So it's pretty amazing you see kids piling out of our cars dressed as superheroes coming to the medical office. It's pretty neat. The, re the, the attorneys upstairs are like, oh, God. Um, there's swords and all this stuff. But that's part of what we do is develop a program where I mean, you come to our property and there's just paint everywhere. There's musical instruments everywhere. There's sewing machines. People are making shoes and jeans and like all kinds of stuff. Um, it's, uh, you know, we tried to start it off with like, you know, step one packets and things like that and it went horribly. Um, so we, we, uh, we acclimated to that and adjusted. Um, but partial hospitalization is going to be a minimum of 20 hours of direct client contact per week. A true partial hospitalization program is a day program. So much like uh, what Dan has going with the recovery high school, um, that you go to school and then you have clinical programming in the evening um, and uh, uh, weekends at home and nights at home. So 
the residential and inpatient. So clinically managed low intensity residential services is, um, uh, uh, we're actually, I'm, we're a 3.3. We're a clinically managed population specific high intensity residential service. So uh, that means that obviously we are boiled down to boys, their adolescence, it's substance use disorder primary. Um, so the, the highest is going to be a medically monitored um, intensive inpatient service. It's going to be a hospital setting. Actually, I'm sorry, medically managed intensive inpatient service level four, um, which I believe Lakeview is probably a level four or 3.7. Uh, medically managed inpatient, more, they have complete capability of all diagnostics medically, nursing. Um, you know, our psychiatrist is great. She comes probably six or seven hours a week, so she sees you know, the kids that are on medication and manage those. More inpatient, true inpatient is like Lakeview, where it is, you know, a supervised medical um, continuum. And uh, so that is the highest level that you can get to. Um, the DSM-5, addition two, has behavioral and physical signs symptoms. So a teenager who meets two has an implied addictive disorder. This may be an erroneous diagnosis in my eyes because due to many possibilities, one, it may simply represent a behavior that is age and developmentally normal. Example, the increased risk taking or peer pressure. So if you're an adult and you're 27 years old and you're like getting, you know, getting high and stealing things from 7-Eleven, that's that's, you know, that's an indicative of, of a difficult thing. You're 14, you have some risk-taking things. You know, there's a lot of 14-year-olds that don't have drug problems that will get high and steal from 7-Eleven, you know what I mean? So, um, also peer pressure. Adults aren't that prone to peer pressure. I mean, we could have a, we could get into a debate about it. I'm sure somebody would have a very educated argument on the opposite end of it. But adults, in general, don't succumb too much to peer pressure, um, as much or e equally so to, to kids. So kids are, especially with um, electronic pressure, um, you know, that, that, that is a big thing that none of us had to deal with. I don't know. You guys might have. You look young. No? Okay. <laughs> none of us had to deal with that type of electronic pressure. Not one of us has any idea what it's like to wake up as a kid and check your phone and look at these things and be bombarded, you could have 1,500 friends. Friends. 1,500 people contacting you at some point through Snapchat, showing you their videos, asking you for pictures. The young ladies today have it so much more difficult. It's unbelievable, unbelievable, if you work close with kids, how much pressure there is to send nude pictures. It is a daily event for these girls. Daily, and uh, and and it's uh, something where they, through peer pressure or whatever. So one of the things, and it might not sound very politically correct to some of you, but if you deal with kids, they're going to do it. We legitimately have groups on safe ways to do it. Don't send your face. Which is a you know. No face, no case. Yeah. Um, I wish that more of them would learn and do that because, uh, you know, in Palm Beach County, now all of a sudden you have your picture in 13 schools. It's, um, it's unbelievable. And you have to live that. Those girls and those boys have to live that life. They have to get up and go to school with people like, so if you're, if you're ever a boy, like an experience of mine, you get into fights or something or get jumped at school. It's an embarrassing thing that happens. Now kids have it on video where kids are just, you know, fighting, hitting each other in the face, people getting knocked out, 13 schools automatically. So everyone knows that that embarrassing moment happened to you. And you have to get up and live that every single day. And it's, uh, it, we cannot underestimate, as much as I know what it's like to use substances as a kid and be a disaster, I have no idea what it's like to be a kid in this age of technology. And the pressures that they feel, you know, we had, you know, Beverly Hills 90210 and like magazines that were like identifying beauty, you know, and wealth and things like that, you know. These kids are posting on Instagram, posting all these things, so money is a big, big deal to them. It is, you know, even more so than the, 
the 80s, the aggressive, you know, the aggressive 80s. These kids ask them what they want to be, rich. How are you going to do that? I have, I'm going to go to business school. <laughs> okay, which business school and what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't do something with business. My dad does business. So they have no idea how to get there, but to a man, they're all going to say they want to be rich. And, uh, and that is a prolification, I think, a lot of, again, it's something that's always been around. It's always been there. You know, narcissism and, and all these things. It's just that they get up and see it every day, all day. And uh, from so many different avenues of their friends and celebrities and, and, and access to the celebrity Snapchats and Instagrams and all that stuff is, uh, it's intense, man. I don't know how I would have dealt with it. I don't know how I would have felt about myself if I had to wake up and look at, you know, somebody who was totally better looking, successful, you know, all the stuff that you like want to be and you're like, oh man, you know, feel terrible about yourself. So, um, I believe, and this is just an opinion, so some of these things are facts, some of these things are opinions. This is my opinion. Telling a parent their child is an addict or alcoholic is irresponsible at this stage of the game. These are not appropriate clinical terms and can be quite subjective. So if I'm a guy that's got you know, 20 years in AA or something and I say, oh, that guy's an alcoholic, you know, that um, is your point of view and your opinion. But if we took a look at clinical diagnostic material that tells us how we're supposed to group these people and kids, there's use, misuse, abuse, and dependence. So they can fall into a couple of categories that don't equal anything to do with having a truly addictive process going on. Also, you're gonna freak them out, and they're not gonna come back to you. So, well, not my parents. They, they, they will, uh, and, and also, I think that that scare tactic stinks. You know, that I, I we, we did an example, and when I worked at Hanley, we started the outpatient, adolescent outpatient center, and we called a couple programs out in Utah, some of these wilderness programs. We pretended to be parents, and we said the thing, like, I started, I found my kid, and he smoked, I think he's smoking weed, I found a half bottle of Zephyr Hills vodka, and they launched into a scare tactic, admissions, aggressive thing that was, jarring. It would be so terrifying if you were a parent, like, but they were good at it. I'm not that good at it. So they were really good. And yeah, and, uh, and, and saying that they need nine months of treatment, you know, all, just went off on, and I, if I were a parent investigating, I'd be terrified. Um, so all of these factors must be taken into consideration when directing your client to a specific facility. So there's really, for kids, only a couple of options. One is a wilderness program, that they, the models they've set up. Do any of you guys know any wilderness programs? Which ones? Four circles, yep. And uh, they've got programs all over the country. So they were um, a subsidiary back in the day of SUS. Um, of the Carolinas, which was one of the original wilderness programs, and then some of the faction of that group branched off. So Four Circles is a very large nationwide. Um, they've got programs, uh, I think in one of the closest ones in Georgia here. Um, so Four Circles, very cool. Anybody else? Do they have one in Duval, or? They cut that in Palm Beach County. So it's one of the, one of the budget cuts, and it's an amazing program. And they, it was a juvenile justice receiving for kids that had substance use disorders, that had substance-related charges. They had a youth ranch. They kept them for nine months, and they cut it. Um, So uh, again, um, identifying and, and knowing your options for wilderness programs and what their models are and what they do. So that their model usually is uh, an integrity-based model. It's more of a manhood model. 
Um, I think it has uh, wonderful components to it. Um, they're probably not going to see an individual therapist uh, as often as they would in a residential treatment program, just because uh, most of the work is being done by their wilderness guides. So that there are, um, there's a program, and, and uh, you know, it, it's in Montana, and it's one of the original wilderness programs. It's called Wilderness Treatment Center. You can write that down. It's an amazing, amazing program because this is where I come. I'm obviously more um, partial to residential treatment because I'm more partial to a lot of therapy, uh, you know, process and things, um, experiential stuff, cool things with kids, school, stuff like that. So WTC, Wilderness Treatment Center, does residential treatment for like three and a half weeks on site. It's a huge, beautiful ranch. And then they do their wilderness trek which is like a three and a half, four week adventure. And so I think that is the amazing marriage and blend of, uh, of the two. And they're the only ones that do that. They're the only wilderness programs that blend it. Um, privately, uh, the Breckies, John Brecky. Um, so they've always stayed family owned. Um, so another thing about adolescent treatment and treatment in general is, uh, you know, They'll have a family-owned program, and then it'll succeed for a while, and then investment companies will come in and buy the family out, and that's cool. I'm all for capitalism, rock and roll, but a lot of times they change it. So it's not like a Lakeview where they came in and made it like infinitely better. It is, uh, it's a shame sometimes because they come in and say, like, you have to cut this person, this person, this person. We're not doing this anymore. It's all bottom line driven. So. Um, but uh, Wilderness Treatment Center has remained in the family and ha was the original one in like 1979. So uh, very cool, very cool program. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, we'll all assume that testing resulted in the need for residential treatment. So let's say as we're going forward for this presentation, you've tested them, they come back positive for benzodiazepines, opiates, alcohol. That is a combination that can kill a kid very easily. The recommendation, and that's what I say to parents at the, the very beginning when we're reviewing it, my primary concern is your child's medical safety. At this juncture, it appears that he has enough stuff in his system, given the wrong event, given the wrong day, given the way your brain is, is firing on that given day or your heart on that given day, he could die. So I'm recommending residential treatment. Um, so, since adolescence is truly defined by a significant physical, mental, emotional, social, and behavioral change, they must be treated differently than adults. So back in the day, they set up adolescent programs and they treated them, and there are books written and all these things, as mini adults. That's archaic. They are not mini adults. They do not have any of the brain power or functioning capacity of adults. They have no future thought. They have none of the consequence thought. Their frontal portion of their brain, um, fight or flight, everything is completely immature. And um, to treat them as many adults, I think, is, um, is a bit archaic. Can I have more water? Just about to get up, but I didn't want to interrupt your flow. Of Thank you. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Again, this could be my opinion. I think it's a, a pretty well known uh, throughout um, people that treat kids, um, a, a well accepted fact that we can't treat them as many adults. We have to die, uh, or assess and diagram treatment plans directly for their brains. So when we're talking about continuums of care and we're talking about residential treatment, you want, or wilderness treatment, um, you want to look for an appropriate residential facility. Facilities incorporating a multi-dimensional approach will best serve the identified youth and their family. So by that, I truly mean family therapy in combination with, thank you, any CBT, MET, 12-step, Minnesota model, which Minnesota model, uh, there's a Minnesota model of, of care and Florida model. So Minnesota model, is like what Lakeview is. So they have proper zoning, and they can house you on site, do all the treatment, do all the medical on site. Florida model was developed, and that is what we offer, uh, because um, 
we have housing and then uh, all the medical is done off-site. So there's two different modalities. Um, but a multi-dimensional approach is going to serve uh, a, the client best. I think with kids, you're going to have to look heavily at their family program and what family system involvement they have. So if they have one phone call every two weeks and a two-day family program, that ain't cool for kids. I mean, that's not going to go very well. I mean, they're, um, even if you're able to have a child and you're able to make some headway and some gains, I guarantee if you drop them back into their home with the same triggers, it'll explode in two weeks, a week maximum, you know? And part of that education of parents is how do you trigger your kid? He walks right in the door from school. Why did you drop your books down? What homework do you have? What, you, you know, you're on top of them right away. We're gonna have to back off a little bit. Given the setting that they just got back from residential treatment, their expectations are not gonna be as high as they were maybe a couple years ago. We're gonna grow those expectations a little bit. So we want, at Family First, we do two phone calls per week, one with the child, and the parents, and one just with our family therapist, who that's all they do, is family therapy, and, uh, and the parents. A lot of education on those phone calls um, about the brain, a lot of education on the parent phone calls with the family therapist about their, uh, uh, their child's potentials, all of these things, because in reality, what we really want to do is when we get them for our family program, have it be very small, and we want to talk to you about you, you being a kid. So the way that you parent is directly resulted by how you were parented. So the way you grew up, if you are the mom or dad that is way hands off, and you grew up with a stern military father that pushed you away and never hugged you and never told you he loved you, uh, maybe you're subconsciously overcompensating for that. And you do not want to be like him. And you want to be loving and accepting and empathic and you know, open and all of these great, great qualities, but it takes it into that kind of codependent side of things where you don't want to hurt them and don't want to scare them and uh, it's a detriment. Um, you know, that being said, you know, that there's the opposite end of the spectrum as well, <laughs> that uh, you are much too rigid and much too harsh and, uh, and, and that is a direct result of chaotic, your mother had mental illness, and that your life and day-to-day -day operation was completely up in the air every single day. So you had no conformity, and all you are trying to do is deliver structure. Again, structure is wonderful, but to an extent. So that's what we spend a lot of our family program on, is getting parents to get light bulb moments of why they do what they do and to understand themselves better. And one of my aims for kids is to understand the kid, for him to understand himself better. But I want parents to understand themselves better too. This is why I did this. If you're looking at a residential program for a child, sometimes you don't, if you're a private practitioner, you have to go off of Katie's word for it. Yet Katie's visited it, and I, I trust Katie implicitly, so we're gonna go with it. My thought is asking, every time what their family program's like. That's it, you know? You don't have to remember too much. What's your family program like? What's that involvement? <clears throat> so understand that comorbidity is a 25% likelihood. By that I mean there's going to be depressive symptoms, there's going to be anxiety, a lot of attention deficit disorder symptoms, um, there could be post-traumatic stress, trauma. So there's going to be a comorbidity by that I mean substance use is not the only thing we're dealing with. Take heavily into account discharge planning. I was a private practitioner and I would send kids to programs and they would knock on my door and nobody called me and told me that they were coming home. And there's mom and Johnny at my door. I have no plan for them. I have no idea that they were coming back. I have no idea really what they worked on, what the goals are, what the discharge plan is. I'll get that, you know, faxed to me in three days. But there was no contact. And I thought, what a bummer, you know? That uh, uh, set this kid up and this family up for not, this is not gonna be a good couple days. Guess what, the kid's already got his phone. He's already got everything. For us, we set that up in the very beginning. 
So we've got a young man, week three. He's got about a 60-day stay with us. Started talking about the phone with his parents on the phone call. And he lost his mind because he's not getting his phone back. But we started that at week three. We didn't start that two days before he was discharged. And the parents have no ability to deal with this kid. He's a complete bully and uh, has pushed them around. And, and this is where the situation we're at. So to set them up that you're going to be the ones like, so at two days, the kid's just going to think, whatever, I'm getting that phone. And he'll get it because he always has. And in you know, 60 days, we're not going to change a whole system. But if we can introduce it at week three, now we've got the kid for five more weeks and the parents for five more weeks to set up the expectation that no, you do not get your phone. This isn't, you know, you haven't matriculated, you know, to, to college. You went to treatment. Congratulations, you did a good job in that setting. So your reward is you get to go home. And then we're going to build back up because you were irresponsible with your phone, your car, your computer, your time. We are going to structure that, and this is how it's going to look. And um, you know, helping parents as much as we can deal with their, their sons and deal with their daughters in our intensive outpatient. Um, so the average length of stay usually for residential treatments or wilderness programs is between 30 and 90 days. Obviously, longer is best. Longer the better. And you know, we were talking about having kids for two years, you know. Uh, that'd be amazing. Doesn't happen um, for us in my, in my world. So um, it's usually between 30 and 90 days. We ask for a minimum of 45 days. And then we do our best because some parents are so codependent and overprotective that they want them home after 30 and they miss them. And you have to start to understand what that dynamic is. Do you really? Or is it that you don't like each other very much and without him there to cause some type of drama or things that you have to work together on, you'd have to actually like hang out. Um, so we are about two years old, so I've lost that boundary or fear of like, oh, I don't want to upset anybody, we're new. We're always full now, so now I have like total bravado. So I'm just like, I just say it. And I'm just like, well, let's take a look at, you know, in a, in a, in a kind way, an empathic way, but call it. How do you guys get along? Are you getting along very well? Well, you know, with Chandler being there, it's like, let's not talk about him for a second. Let's just talk about you guys and see how you're doing. Um, and oftentimes it's not very well, and they need that, that kid in there because that's their link, that's their commonality, and like treatment planning for him has been a big deal for their marriage for the last 10 years. Um, so 30 to 90 days, understandably finances play into this, insurance plays into this, you know, that managed care is, is a bummer. Um, I mean, it was a necessity because again, people were keeping people too long. It was too long for kids. I, I think first time for a kid should probably be about 60 days. You shouldn't keep a kid that much longer. Let's get him home, get him some skills, get the family some skills, depending on the acuity, and let them see what they can do. You know, And uh, as we'll go forward, we're talking continued care and uh, the continuum. So uh, there are so many options for treatment. Adult world is much more flooded than kid world, but really great marketing doesn't always equal really good treatment. So people have legitimately set up websites that that's not their place. So that it's, I mean, it's wild. Um, you'll see like a place on the beach, and it's not on the beach. It's like 16 miles inland in Hobe Sound. Um, so Hobe Sound's great, but I mean, if you have a picture of a, a place on the beach, that's, that's not that cool. So. The intense, intense need for, when we talk about discharge planning, for aftercare. My estimation, the most important part of treatment. So when we're doing residential treatment, we're stabilizing, we're letting the client's brain take a break from substances, because even 60 days for an adolescent brain, you map that stuff at night, even at night, and just see the connections being made. I mean, just, it's amazing what they are, are, are doing, their brains are doing neuro neurologically. To remove all substances from that, so at the baseline, you've got stabilization of family and abstinence. 
which are great. Now we work on some coping skills. We use a lot of dialectical behavioral strategies with that. We don't try and run the whole seven gamut. Focus on a couple with kids, you know, and um, uh, work on their family system and work on the relationship with their parents and work on triggers for home. So the most important thing is they're going home. They're 16 years old for the most part. My families, you know, there are uh, programs and, and places around the country. I don't know if you guys have a lot of educational consultants in the area, ed consultants. So it's a, you know, once you get into Miami, New York, LA, Chicago, that, those types of things, there are people, there's a whole sub, subsect called educational consultants that help manage families and get them through. These families usually have wealth and they can do um, therapeutic boarding schools, which are probably, you know, between eight and twelve thousand dollars a month for a year after the residential treatments. My families usually can't rock that way. I mean, it's ideal given, you know, some of their behaviors um, to be able to be put in a setting with their peers and trying to continue to work on things in school, but not a reality for most people. So, you have to get very creative when you get referrals from Galveston, Texas. You know, that we have to get very creative with that. And uh, our discharge planning is, is very, very important for that kid uh, and the family. So, yeah. Yep, Jacksonville. Um, so uh, we have Jacksonville, Houston, Nashville, Philadelphia, Charlotte, uh, Miami, Cooper City, which is a little bit north of Miami, and I think we had like th we have three from Houston. Uh, no, what? No, I'm sorry, two from Houston, one from Dallas. So um, that uh, they're from from all over. Um, a lot of times with my intensive outpatient, we don't take those kids into our program because we are not a locked facility like this, and those kids know where they are. I pick a kid up from Dallas, Texas and his family at the airport at 11 on a Saturday night and drive them into unincorporated Palm Beach County. That kid has no clue where he is, and so he's, he's spun. He's not going to run. He's not, you know, where's he going? Um, we're in the middle of the woods out there. So. But a kid from Palm Beach Gardens or a kid from West Palm Beach, that kid knows where he is. And he could have kids over at the house. He could bail. It's just, it jeopardizes the milieu too much. That's why I've spread out and done a lot of my marketing to other areas. So um, if we were to look at reports of follow-up studies that showed the adolescent's ability to maintain or continue their treatment gains, the results are a bit less positive. In fact, there's a very high rate of relapse, very high. So what are your success rates? They'll ask you, what are your success rates? Anybody that gives you success rates or percentages is lying to you. So that's, uh, I would say my success rate is probably, you know, pretty subjective to your family. So what's your idea of success? My idea of success might be different than a parent's idea. They might, again, going back to, they might I'll want them, they can smoke weed, just clean your room, don't tell me to F myself, and get Bs. That's your level and idea of success. Cool, we will honor that. We're an abstinence-based facility. Our idea of success rate might be different. The idea that you are going to have a kid then remain abstinent for the rest of their lives and not experience any bumps and bruises along the way, um, especially within the first 90 days of returning home, is. A, False thinking. You haven't you haven't dealt with kids, um, so also our success rates are going to increase if you follow our recommendations. How many parents follow our recommendations? Not many. Not many. You know that uh, they are resistant to getting their own treatment. They're resistant to getting their own therapists. You know, and uh, and resistant to then. Um, Residential treatment is actually easier for them than outpatient treatment. Outpatient, they have to drive them there. They have to go to the groups. They have to do all the laborious stuff that happens. Residential treatment's easier. So, um, again, if anyone tries to talk to me about success rates, um, it's you know, it's not it's not great. 
their kids, and this system has been developed over the course of the last 16, 17 years. For us to undo all of that in 60 days is not, uh, you know, if you think that that's what's going to happen, don't come. I tell them, don't, don't do it, because we'll just disappoint you. If you want to, you know, work on X, Y, and Z, and it, then, then we'll have a, a, a different experience and a different expectation. Um, treatment needs to be regarded as a long-term continuum of interventions, especially for adolescents. So the first intervention has occurred, they're in residential treatment. There's a secondary intervention and third intervention all throughout the course of residential treatment with the family and with the kid in regards to continuing care afterwards. Continued interventions along the way, because they are going to mess up. So we're going to give you a playbook on what to do if he turns his phone off and doesn't come home Friday night. What does that mean for you guys? So we want to prepare for the worst, hope for the best. It's not going to go that great, though. They're going to have some difficulties. Some kids surprise the ever-loving heck out of you. And they call from Philadelphia and say, I've been sober for six months. I'm seeing my counselor. I love that guy. Thank you for introducing him to me. You guys are the best. You know, Those are great phone calls. Outliers. <laughs> And then you have the phone call that is, you know, Carson from Alabama, whose family's in the military, is an amazing kid, loved him, a little mentally ill on top of the substance use, has now been in and out of jail three times and has been to treatment six more times since us and is still struggling. Yes? In your two years, um, have you been able to correlate the success relative to success all of the time between the kids that you discharge to a recovery process? There hasn't been one to recovery high schools, because there aren't, aren't many. There's one in New Jersey. There's one in Houston. Oh, the original in Houston. Yeah. Um, that uh, the two Houston kids have returned to boarding schools. So the original, one of the original ones, Archway Academy, where Dan actually got the blueprint, um, is uh, one of the most amazing environments you'll ever step foot on. It is shocking. It's just a bunch of kids, sober, like a hundred of them, in a high school, in this amazing church, classrooms, teachers. It's like Shangri-La of adolescent treatment. It's a um, <coughs> Houston. Yeah. So, um, Recovery high schools usually don't get a lot of traction. Dan's recovery high school, when I showed up and saw there was 12 kids, I was shocked. Because much like him, I've traveled all over. I haven't stayed in Palm Beach County. I've been in New Jersey. I've been in Philadelphia, New York City. I've been everywhere to talk about and see adolescent programs. There's a, an amazing adolescent high school in New Jersey, um, and it has four kids. And they've been around for like five years. They have cool fundraisers. They got like Bruce Springsteen behind some of it. And they have five kids. Dan had like 12 in like, I don't know, like four months. It was like we unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bruce would probably hook it up and give you a really great van. Pay for a driver. So this is a pretty odd number, but. 36% of adolescents discharged from residential, res, residential facilities attended one or more aftercare sessions at community clinics. That's kind of ridiculous. So there's like 64% of kids don't even attend one session. So one of the major things to do with kids and with families is you don't leave it up to them. You don't say, here's the information, give them a call and set it up. We do that weeks before. We set up the day, we set up the time, everything. Some, some of them still don't go. Some of them, they'll give you the one just because they you know, want to prove that they're trying. But um, if you leave it up to them, most of the time they will not attend. Um, so that's a bummer, man. It's a real bummer. Um, and it's a mountain that uh, is, uh, is difficult to climb. Uh, especially in some certain uh, sects of, uh, of families and of kids that, you know, you, you're fighting the parents as much as you're fighting the, the children. 
So this can be for a number of different reasons, but mainly it is due to the family's potential in inability to access services. Some people are in remote areas. Um, in that regard, what we are doing, the cool thing about technology is that we can, that kid in Galveston, Texas, can set up Skype sessions with a therapist that primarily does Skype sessions that we know in New York City. And they can have that access because we looked in their directory of uh, clinicians and called the four that are in the area and none of them were going to be okay. So um, family apathy, you know, which is under, you know, is, is unfortunate. And, um, and also misunderstanding. So example, the efficacy of a long-term intervention. So they misunderstand because you've sold them on something that is they're gonna, their kid and their family is going to be better after 60 days, and it's not true. So you, you have to set them up for what the truth is, which is this is a long-term intervention. And you're going to, it's, it's terrible, and I'm so sorry. It's much like your child being stricken with a diabetes or with cancer. Long-term interventions are going to be best to, to tackle this. Um, so my main point here is not to ever set blame or shame on parents. In the real world, though, adolescents are legally bound to adhere to their guardian's chain of command. It's just the way it is. How do I get him there? It's a shocking thing to me. So even though it was a disaster of a kid, if my dad said I was going somewhere, I was going there. Now, I may not have remained there. I may have tried to run away from there. But I was going to initially go because they, they had just had that control. But a lot of parents at this point of the stage of the game have no control. I have a, a child coming in on Sunday morning. And so I said, best thing to do is try yourselves. If not, here's an interventionist. And I would say give it an hour with you guys. There is no convincing. It's just your bags are packed. This is what we're doing. This is in the best interest of our family. If they run away, freak out, you know, X, Y, and Z, disengage. Because you are professionally not capable to handle that. Parentally, they're not listening to you. Disengage from it. OK, cool. And then call an interventionist. They come in and professionally make it happen. But in the end, they have to do what you say. If you have a child and you want to move to Cincinnati, that kid's got to go to Cincinnati with you. Um, so if you want them to go to treatment, they got to go to treatment. Um, most families at this level of care, the residential treatment, have already experienced ex great levels of hopelessness, anger, and fear for their child's safety. You know, um, so it's it, it, with an understanding and and you know um, that families are going through a lot right now. You know. That you know that they I, I can become more annoyed with them than anyone, but in reality they're going through a lot, and most of them are really truly doing the best that they can, and so to to keep that in mind and keep the empathy in mind. Without constant and effective family intervention throughout a youngster's residential treatment stay, your odds are going way down that the family will enforce the need for long-term aftercare. That just goes to say what we said before. If you do a week before they discharge and you give the recommendations that, you know what, you're going to go to X extended care program. It's in Orange County, California. It's a wonderful place. You'll get to surf. You're going to get a little volunteer job and do school. They're going to lose their minds. The kids are going to go, they're not going to, you know, they're going to freak out. You have to introduce that early on in the process. Now, doesn't bode well for us and our staff because we have to deal with the nightmare that is their resistance. But it limits the parents' ability or, or, or reckoning with that. So if you did that and, and did it in, in the middle of a family week and tried to like send the parents off with the, the kid with this recommendation, um, it's not going to go very well for them. I mean, they have clearly lost a lot of control and they're not going to be able to enact that. So we have to help them. Um, and the idea of a 16-year-old person being able to comprehend the need for long-term care is going to be medically misinformed, and by that I mean neurologically misinformed, that those kids don't see past Friday night. Friday night's the biggest night of their life, you know, their future means truly nothing. They have like kind of a glimpse or an idea, but nine months to a kid is an eternity, you know, 
and, um, and, and it, is, it, it, it really rolls that way into late teens and early 20s that, you know, yes? Yes. Right. And and most, if not all, parents, like you said, would be aggressively involved in their kid's diabetic oh, treatment. Heck yeah. And and, and right. sitting down yeah. with them. Um, also, they're pretty aggressively involved at some points with their education. And are you going to let your 16-year-old dictate to you their educational needs? That's not going to go that well. They're going to figure it out later. You know, well, I'll get it done later. I'll figure it out later. So. But giving the parents like that source of strength, like, yeah. yeah, you probably feel really good when it comes to managing your health and stuff. That's a walk in the park. How is that any different from this? Right. No, you're absolutely right. What is it about this, you know, for them? What is this wiggling around? And why are we saying they've still got the window between the shelf and the hall? How is that any different? Right. Well, and also the lack of services for parents. So like our group um, has, uh, uh, it's a, a, the free family support group on Monday nights. is a community group where parents come in and they like see other people that are like them. I remember I was a disaster, disaster of a kid. And my mother said she wasn't necessarily embarrassed by me, but she didn't know what to do with me. She didn't know who to talk to about what was going on. And she definitely did not want me labeled. She did not want me to be labeled as a troublemaker or an addict. She did not want my future compromised by what was going on at 16 years old. Um, but she, there was no resources. There was no one, she still always says now, there was no one like you. There was nothing like this where we were from in Winter Park, Florida, nothing. So we just kind of dealt with it. I, she didn't really want to talk to her sisters about it. She didn't really want to talk to anybody about it because uh, again, not a level of embarrassment, but so much as she was protective of me and did not want me to be looked at differently by anyone. And, uh, you know, once you get, it's unfortunate. So we're in this world, right, of substance use and things like that. The majority of the world doesn't care, thinks substance, use, substance users are just throwaways, are bad. It's, uh, you know, you can get a real sense of what the general theme of substance use is. Just look at comments. When you have the opiate deaths and things like that, look at the comments. 
That's what the majority of America thinks. One less dead drug addict, one less person to rob my house, one less, you know. Sure. Right. So, you know, I guess, you know, not so that the parents are going to do it. You're not blaming the parents or saying, you know, it's so they're in here to see what I'm going to do to the patient. Right. So it's not a matter of feeling guilty or feeling victimizing. It was an addiction for me. And then, you know, really with, uh, 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 humans in general, you're going to behave based off of your feelings and thoughts. So understanding a parent's feelings and thoughts are going to be a big deal in regards to the system. And, uh, and if they feel like a failure or feel sad or angry or frustrated and think that they're um, bad parents or think that they've failed or it's a direct reflection, we got to get that out on the table. because. <clears throat> a lot of times, it, I mean, we're just, again, human nature. You deal with things internally in your head, it doesn't go that great usually. You usually kind of try and always trend off into some black and white thinking where you get that it's always going to be this way, and it's just humans in general. So um, if we can get all that stuff out on the table, it, 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 it works you know, much better for the system. The system has to be prepared. If by the point they're at residential treatment, it's the highest level of care that they can go before jail, so the system has to be prepared for this to be an ongoing theme. Trouble and behavioral and mental health, substance use, this is going to be a theme for you guys for a little while. And um, how best to arm you with the, the tools to, to combat it. Um, so uh, the, the idea of uh, them being able to comprehend the need for long-term care is going to be misinformed because they're frontal lobe and cortex is about 10 years from being fully developed, which equals and the, one of the most important components is future thinking. That is, adults are able to have, now there are, you start getting high at 13, you're going to be 28 years old and probably still have that same mentality. But for the most part, a, a, an appropriate adult that goes through their coping skills in late teens and learns how to... Oh yeah, no, there are a lot of them. Um, but for the most part, you're going to go through, 90% of America is going to go through their bumps and bruises. They're going to learn their coping skills internally, externally, how to soothe themselves, how to deal with disappointment, all of these things. Um, but with kids, they have no thought that this is ever going away. So when I said that black and white thinking, they are the ultimate black and white thinkers. They, in that moment, will think that this is always the way it's going to be. I'm always going to be in trouble. I'm never going to be able to succeed. Um, and they use these absolute words and absolute thought processes. And it's, it, you, it's a very difficult thing unwinding. So we would sit down and we do some gestalt stuff. We just go like knees to knees. And you like look at me in the eyes. And we'll just have to tell you over and over. Tell me again. Your brain is attacking you. Tell me again. And they will repeatedly, over and over, be like, I'm never going to get out of trouble. You don't understand. How is that possible? How is this possible that you're never going to get out of trouble? Let's start stretching it out. Do you think at 21 years old that you're going to be in the same trouble right now? They can't think that far. So you're dealing with somebody that can't think that far. I can think that far now. I can think, you know, 37 years old. You can think about, like, you know, 401ks and things. That's like ultimate future <laughs> thinking, right? The 401k is like the ultimate future thought. And when you're 24, you, ain't, you, know, you don't have a 401k. And you're 24 years old. So, um, but uh, as your brain goes, so does the future thought. So um, the family's attitude regarding the disease concept. 
So you want to slowly integrate that, I believe. What is your understanding of this as a disorder? Do you understand that the American Medical Association deemed this and classifies it as a disease? So with a disease, you have a disease concept and a model. Let's talk about that. And that's a lot of the education that we do primarily at Family First over the phone. We do a lot of that. So we don't want to have them in that family program doing a lot of whiteboard stuff and didactic things. We want to do that over the phone and get the process going in person. So, you know, some people, <laughs> they will, you know, it's, it's very interesting, but they will reject that, the American Medical Association's concept of addiction. But they'll accept the American Medical Association's concept of cancer or diabetes or... No. No? No. So, they have a, substance abuse disorder? a substance use disorder that this can, and the, the terms are abuse and dependence. So, so dependence you can, yes, you can transfer. So your son currently sits in diagnostic criteria of abuse. Let's go over that. This can transition quickly, neurologically, without anyone knowing. It's a neurological event that occurs internally, and it just switches. Once you are dependent, it is proven you can never go back. So now you're at dependency. So again, we're staying away from addiction. We're staying away from all the words that, and we're staying medical, medical, medical. And then you can introduce this is the concept and the disease model of dependency. And, uh, and, and do you see this lining out for your family? Do you know anyone in your family that has that? It's true. There's always someone. Um, so the disease concept uh, of this is a widely regarded and accepted medical fact. But you're going to run into families that will reject that. That's true. This could very well be. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't born there. But um, it's true. Um, so if they are willing to, hopefully, accept um, the AMA's definition of this disorder, that this is a complex genetic and phenotypical disorder, then logically, one would engage in suggested treatment. So if you are, so let's talk about now you've accepted the fact that you understand that this is a disease and that there's a very likely, if left unchecked, uh, a transition into dependency, which you can never then go back. Hopefully, we'll talk about extended continuum of cares and, and how best to, uh, to treat that. So the problem is, like any other disease, treatment is not a guarantee. You have a disease, and you're getting treatment for any number of these things. It is not a guarantee that you will live through it. It's not a guarantee that it subsides um, and uh, um, goes into remission. And it can go, like any other disease, it can go into remission and it can come back. So um, these are things to set families up for so that they understand what they're getting into. So one of the, the hallmarks, I believe, Again, this is a little bit more of opinion and working very closely with kids for a lot of years is temperament. So if you can start to understand, uh, and you can look at family's temperament too, but by that, um, I mean that the client and guardians will indicate levels of willingness to extend treatment past the initial phases and directly plays into motivation or resistance. So when engaged in a completely resistant family system, Family First Adolescent Services uses a multitude of interventions free family support education process groups that we have at our center. We uh, staff, which is then every single member of our clinical team meets with the family in our conference room to voice concerns. And if all else fails, we just show unconditional love and give them the freedom to re-engage at any time. So again, one of the things about treating kids differently than adults, it is appropriate at a time with a 24-year-old to Remove them from treatment. Remove the family from treatment. They're not listening to anything. You are perpetuating a cycle and a system that is unhealthy. With kids, they're just getting started. It's just getting started. And for the most part, I've probably known you guys for three weeks. 
So the idea of that I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to treat, you can't come anymore because you didn't do your Al-Anon meeting, or you know, this really isn't working out because X, Y, and Z. You're not going to have any, first of all, you're not going to have any clients. And second of all, you're going to miss out on opportunities that come a lot of times way down the road. You know, there are events that occur in the home and events occur in the system that give you the opportunity to wrap your arms around it and get a better hold of things. So, what time is it? Terrific. So, we're just in time to, uh, to start to round things out. Um, and there's someone here from Re Florida Recovery Schools? Okay. So examples of transitional care. So once you have left residential treatment, transitional living or extended care, there are adolescent halfway houses. Um, again, one of the things that I want to be, and Katie is very knowledgeable um, uh, across the board, my focus is kids. So I'm going to give you information. If you need, uh, if you have a 10-year-old that is cutting themselves, call me and I'll know a facility that would be appropriate for that kid. Um, if they have X insurance, Y means X problems, I have patented myself and our program as people that will find you the program in the country in regards to adolescent care. So, um, but there are extended care in halfway houses. There's one in Louisiana, they're in uh, Minneapolis, there's one in California. These are directly dealing with adolescents. There's one in the state of Washington. Uh, there's one in Arizona. Um, so there is true PHP models of care like we went over that are minimum 20 hours a week. They're more of day treatment. Uh, the intensive outpatient, uh, nine hours per week. Outpatient services is one hour. Community-based support groups, usually primarily AA or NA. Um, and there's case management, example drug court, adolescent specific drug court, which is one of my, uh, you know, it's a bummer that you're in the system, kid, but it's one of my favorite things. It is their success rates, like uh, if you're treating adults, so you have PRN. You ever had a doctor or an airline pilot in your, in your care? They, they have a, the airline pilots have a 90% success rate. Why? because first of all, you get to treat adults and their brains are a little bit more rational, but they put them in a 10-year program. So you get caught drinking and flying or, or having a drug problem, they will put you in a professional program for seven to 10 years. You wake up in the first three years, every single morning of your life, to a computer screen that you have a certain color, and if that color pops, you'd better go test within that hour. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, it doesn't matter if you're giving birth, they don't care, and they will, cut your job, cut your benefits, cut everything, you'll be fired. This, they have this amazing success rate. So I selfishly like drug court in, when, kid, when they're involved because they test and they have a lot of control and power and they're great allies. And we work in Palm Beach County, with, we work amazingly with, with, it's a seamless thing that we have going on because their goal is not to punish and not to be punitive, and neither is ours. Their goal is treatment. In reality, drug court in our county, Palm Beach, goal is treatment and to get them help. They work with us. So we sometimes make the call of, let's pull it, pull the trigger, he's gotta go, he's gonna have to go do the 90 days or, or whatever, it's time. But they, if they're involved in our program and they fail their test, they don't get popped right away. They don't get pulled right away. Um, but there is time when it's, it's you know. Yeah. If we could keep them on for 10 years, it'd be great. Um, but, you know, they usually do about like nine months to a year. But in that nine months to a year, one of the other things is with kids, and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we're an abstinence-based model, but I put a lot of stock into uh, harm reduction especially with a child because, again, neurologically, they are growing, growing, growing so fast. So if you can reduce the amount of times they get high, you're increasing the amount of intelligence that they're obtaining over the course of that time. So with drug court, I mean, they might get high once a month and fail once a month, but boy, is that better than every single day. So 30 to 1, I'll take it. And uh, um, so drug court is a, a great, um, a great, uh, 
side, side uh, treatment uh, modality for us. Um, so the main focus of ongoing treatment is to directly impede the path from substance use abuse into a full substance use disorder. That is our goal. Our goal is to stop the train right there and impede that process. If you smoke weed every day of your life, no matter what your genetic history is, no matter what anything, you will become at some point dependent on that. Um, and for the most part, who really stays at smoking weed every day? Most of the time, kids, if they've got a use disorder, are going to step it up. So this is done by further reducing and eliminating legal, social, family, and educational consequences. Again, our goal for kids is to protect them. I want to protect them from severe legal consequences, from severe educational consequences. We have a high school at Family First at our treatment center. So we all, all of our kids, for the most part, um, are hospital homebound, and we do a lot of credit recovery. The last thing I want, and there's a kid in right now, I love that kid, um, but he's get, you know, the last thing I really want is a GED. Kids will say they want GEDs. They don't, really. They don't want to be different. Kids don't want to be different, and they don't want to be viewed at as stupid or different in any way. So we do our very, very best to avoid that. Some kids are rocking you know, freshman credits at 18 years old almost, and it's just a no-go. You, you got to go the other route. But with that, we remain extremely positive, and we look to community colleges. We look to a, a growth and a goal and a pattern that will make sense. So, um, but allowing brain chemistry to continue the critical phases of development and allowing for pharmacological gains and failures in assessment. So if you um, are ever working with psychiatrists and working with kids in medication, it fails more often than it works. And there is a huge trial and error process with kids, and it can be very frustrating for families and very frustrating for kids. Um, continued family restructuring and family system improvement. The ideal titration schedule, again, this is a, an opinion of mine. Um, so for a 90-day residential treatment stay into a minimum of six months of an extended care, um, example would be sober high schools, transitional homes and programs, including in that a 90-day intensive outpatient, continued community-based support attendance, ongoing outpatient individual family therapy to combine for an entire year. So one full year of complete services. And after all of that, all of that money, all of that time, all of that fear, all of that anxiety, there is like no guarantee at all that this will work. But what I will guarantee is that you will come out from our program educated, armed with more facts about yourself, and, uh, and you're a client of ours forever. And parents do call after and, and have no idea, you know, they lost the, lost the relapse plan that, you know, that, that we had. But, um, uh, you know, I want to, uh, I did have a little bit more information on recovery schools, um, but I deleted that because I would like, um, uh, Aaron, the professional, to, uh, um, to deliver that message because they have an amazing school going on. And um, I just want to thank all of you for being attentive and uh, uh, welcoming me. And um, thank you. That's it.